author of several books on the state of the world, former Guardian writer and investigative journalist Nafis Ahmed chatted with me about his objectives for PressCoin. How did you get started in what you're doing now? Well, I mean, it's a long story, and I'll try and keep it very, very brief to, to simply say that um, I, you know, I, I was very excited about uh, getting into academia after an interesting journey, uh, which I'm not going to go into too much detail, but to cut a long story short, my journey into academia, uh, I went in as uh, an international relations uh, a student, um, and I was very interested in understanding mass violence. What is it that drives people to, to acts of different types of violence? And what is it that makes different systems violent in different ways? You know, there are some types of violence which are not necessarily direct and physical. So that kind of led me into this big journey into looking at how we frame these things, how we understand these things. And one of the big things I was seeing from an academic point of view was that academics often were very, and scientists were often operating in their silos. They weren't connecting dots. They were looking at economics, you know, and they were, you had others looking at politics. You had others looking at bigger biophysical issues like climate change. Um, and others looking at oil and energy who are geologists. And unfortunately, um, the reality is that the, the, the re reality of the world doesn't operate in that way. Everything is actually seamlessly interconnected in quite complex and intricate ways. Um, and what I was seeing was that we had a tendency to dig deep and to take things apart to understand how things worked, which had got us quite far and uh, in understanding things, but we weren't seeing how all of those mechanics on a micro level were working and operating in a really big complex way on a macro level. And so that was creating this big kind of gaping hole as far as I could see it, that we didn't really understand how all of these systems were playing out on a global scale. And as, as, so we kept seeing all these wild cards and this is, what, and this is the situation we're in now where we're seeing this convergence of these multiple crises, climate change, energy, food, uh, you know, civil unrest, you know, the breakdown of families, all sorts of things which are normally diagnosed in, in, you know, in their own silos. But what I was beginning to realize was that actually this was all part of a, a, a single systemic crisis related to the structure of our civilization. Um, and obviously that's kind of a very simple way of looking at it. But actually underlying that is a lot of complicated kind of analysis of really how these systems work and fit together. And that kind of was what got me into academia, got me interested in academia. But I moved away from academia because what I was also seeing was that that wasn't the environment that I wanted to operate in because I couldn't see people having the conversations that needed to be had within those circles. So, I mean, it, and I know every, every academic knows that it's a real struggle to get sometimes your own peers in your community to read your work. Um, and, 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 every, and everybody has that have problem in this sphere, let alone the, the wider public to be, to, to be able to access this kind of highbrow scholarly literature. So my thing was, how do we get this stuff out to people? How do we make this real for people? How do we cultivate these conversations? So I, I wanted to be grounded in, in kind of solid, rigorous research. But really, what I could see was the, the battleground really was, was out there in the public sphere, civil society, where people were having to get their hands dirty, were seeing real problems, dealing with real problems on a day to day level. So we had to make this, we have to kind of really make this stuff real for people because it is real for people. Um, so that can, became kind of like a, a sense of mission for me is how to really get this out there. And so my journalism was, was a lot about focusing on getting these sort of systems ideas and, and, and into the kind of a wider kind of public uh, and kind of just public, just generating public awareness of these issues. And that was what led me into this journey of, of, of being an investigative journalist that looks into all of these big issues that we're so whether it's Iraq war or national security issues or, you know, surveillance or foreign policy, but what's the drive, but what's the driving systems behind these trends that we're seeing? So I wanted to kind of look at a different approach to how we do investigative journalism, which isn't just about finding a declassified document or 
uh, a kind of very exclusive source, but but it involves that kind of work, but also brings that together with, but how does that fit with all of these big systems that we see kind of rumbling on in the background? How does it all fit together? So we developed this uh, method called Open Inquiry uh, uh, over in Surge Intelligence, which I can talk about in more detail. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the last few, few years, specifically from, via my crowdfunded journalism platform, is investigating all of the big global issues that most of us consider to be the most important things and trying to contextualize them, trying to understand them, trying to look at um, why they're happening, how they're happening. Um, and yeah, name names, do a lot of muckraking, but always ground it in a kind of a complex systems approach that most journalism outlets aren't really doing. You've, you've worked with platforms that people like maybe Matt Dahibi and others have done, but the main difference I think is that we can no longer depend on freedom of the press because the media is owned by three companies in every country just about, right? So one of the things that you stand for is, uh, with, with the crowdfunding aspect, is uh, going around this problem of sponsors, especially big money sponsors in television. And we we have, and you have now, the means to do this. So, so Randy, you I mean the way, so, I mean, I set up the crowdfund as an experiment uh, in 2014, when I found myself in this situation, having uh, just had a gig at The Guardian um, and had a kind of interesting experience there where, you know, I was running uh, kind of these investigative pieces on this blog called Earth Insight, where The Guardian had commissioned me to write these stories about the geopolitics of the environment. You know, what are the interconnected things that connect you know, society, politics, and economics to these big environmental energy trends that we're seeing in the world. So I've been writing about Syria. I've been looking at Iraq. I've been like writing about Ukraine, and you know, and they were loving it. And then I wrote a piece about um, Israel and Palestine, and uh, the piece basically uh, excavated some interesting historical information that looked at the role of Gaza's gas resources, offshore gas resources and how those appear to have been motivating, um, partly motivating Israel's interest in eliminating Hamas from Gaza. Um, and, and that was all based on a policy paper written at the time by Moshe Alon, who was the incumbent defense minister at that time, where he'd actually said this. Um, and my experience in the Guardian was extraordinary because having posted that on my blog, and we, I had a, we had a great gig where I could publish straight to the Guardian website, you know, we'd been we'd had editorial training, so we we had that freedom of 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 expression in that sense, which is wonderful. But I got a call from my editor the next day, and he said, "The fees we're going to have to cancel your blog." And I was like, "Whoa, like why?" And he said, "You've written a story; it's not an environment story." And I was like, "But this is exactly what you've been commissioning me to write for the last year and a half. How could this not be an environment story?" And I was I was just really shocked by the whole thing and after a period of soul searching about you know what no trying to get back in the guardian and all the rest of it i realized that no matter what happens in terms of whether i rehabilitate myself in the mainstream or not and to some extent i did i mean i got a column at vice and all the rest of it you know and i was writing through a lot of other places but i realized that fundamentally i mean what if, you know when you have a very good uh, solid in you know, kind of liberal paper like The Guardian, kind of going through these sorts of strange editorial issues. We really have a problem, you know, with the media. We need to find another model. So I set up the Patreon site, which kind of does these subscription micropayments, where a small community of people will pay um, a very small number, which they choose, which I made it basically open to people to choose how much they wanted to pay per month to support my work. And the idea is that I would, this would allow me to uh, kind of to fund long form investigations that nobody else was doing. Um, we did this for, did this in this way for about two to three years, breaking some really interesting and powerful stories such as, you know, how Google was seed funded by the CIA and, and NSA, um, how the Pentagon uh, anticipated the rise of ISIS, um, and, and all sorts of issues, you know, the climate models, um, that were funded by the British Foreign Office, which looked at the potential of massive food riots by 2040, which could endanger governments worldwide, all sorts of things. 
that nobody was really talking about. And we impacted the news cycle. What I found was that when you do some really good investigative work, even though you might not get commissioned by these places to do that sort of work, but it picks up steam because people want to know what's really going on. You know, your average citizen wants answers. And that was what gave it momentum. And we found that some of our stories were getting picked up by The Independent, by USA Today, Washington Post, were talking about the stuff we were putting out, which is totally extraordinary, given the shoestring budget we're operating on. And over the last year, you know, I began working with a team um, all over the world, people from North America, people from uh, India, including Amit, who you spoke to. Um, and we came together along this idea of, of building a next generation platform for InSearch that would kind of uh, really solidify the design for the type of investigative journalism we were doing, how we could use that to change the way that people were dealing with information, uh, to kind of overcome these polarities which we see in the world, you know, the left and the right, liberal and conservative, blah, 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 get over those polarities in the sense that not saying that we want to extinguish them, but saying that how can we allow ourselves to have generative conversations despite our disagreements, despite coming from our different political points of view, which are totally legitimate within a certain perspective, but can we have meaningful conversations that move us to a place where we can take real action in the world about the problems that we all of us are worried about? So that was our kind of mission if, in terms of building the next generation for InSearch. And that led us into, I mean, we'd always intended when we began designing this to, to use the blockchain as a way to, to situate all of that. Because of course, the blockchain as a technology, as a programming code, gives us all sorts of opportunities to, to, uh, to kind of allow and cultivate that sort of participation because you can look at different ways of uh, looking uh, at, at measuring reputation and you can link those uh, types of, you can look at measuring reputation and link it up to different types of activity on the platform, uh, different types of conversation. So what we were looking at was really, how can we use these algorithms to say, we want to cultivate this type of conversation that is generative, which generates insights, which generates verifiable data points that people find useful, um, and that can lead to positive action in the world. Those are the three kind of core categories of information that we decided, these are the three things that really can, can work. So now that we've identified those, can we, can we kind of code this in to say these are the types of information we want to see surfacing in articles, surfacing in conversations? Can we build that in? Yeah, the blockchain will be a great way to track all of that stuff on a distributed ledger, um, and hey, we can now build um, a revenue system around this, but we can actually reward people when they participate in a way with, that is generative, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a participant. So that was the kind of initial kind of design thinking that went behind this idea. And of course, this is really what gave birth to PressCoin when we were seeing, well, you know, from investigative journalism, which is the kind of in search kind of hub where we're kind of looking into deep issues um, doing long-form stories and then really excavating what's going on and then trying to identify solutions to that. We then saw that, well, we also need to deal with some more concrete things, such as what about the brokenness of the political system? So this led us to do a lot of brainstorming about if we were going to have other platforms in this infrastructure, what would they look like? And so that gave birth to a whole host of um, different ideas and we decided that we needed to build an infrastructure that would obviously investigative journalism and our format of open inquiry was was at the center of it kind of the central nervous system of this ecosystem we wanted to build but then we wanted to kind of move okay so let's now build out uh, use this format to inform how we hold politicians to account so that gave birth to the idea of next elections as a platform on the in the press coin ecosystem that would allow us to have again using this idea of measurements and scorecards for politicians galvanizing communities around them and that sort of thing and then we had some other ideas about solutions journalism um citizen journalism so we came up with this uh, with a suite of other platform ideas and several of them are we have teams working on them actively right now um designing them and and, and uh 
bringing having ideas for how to extend the technology into that in surge is the is the kind of the more operational one on the platform and this is how we then I could go to go into more detail about the kind of the revenue models so this is how we came up with the idea of to the token system and how that would work so so obviously right now in surge is kind of crowdfunded on a small time basis by a small community so we began growing our journalism network our currently if we look at all the journalists on our in our network that we brought on who have said yep yeah, we'd love to be involved in press coin and insertion or the rest of it you know we've got some great people like you know we've got john pilger um abby martin uh lance wheeler we've got um um barker dutt from india all together we've got something like six million uh, followers on our social networks and so what we saw was that all we'd really have to do is kind of convert a percentage of our existing follower base into subscriptions in order to have a really good op good chance to to go straight out of the gate um, into a kind of really strong subscription model in a way that maybe other kind of startups might not be able to do so quickly that was and so we and we wanted to kind of just focus on this idea as well that readers should be at the core you know readers or viewers or users should be at the core of the journalism in the media that we're doing um, in terms of the funding and in terms of the, the benefits. So InSurge has subscriptions as its kind of backbone in terms of the revenue model. Um, we're not completely close to advertising. In fact, what we're, we're looking at now um, is various ways of making advertising ethical in a way that isn't being done at all in, in the mainstream. Um, so having really strong vetting process for advertising, using native advertising, and and building this in with, with a lot more audience participation, so they get to see things that they want to see rather than being kind of blasted with things that they're completely not interested in and don't want to have anything to do with. So we've, we're exploring that, but we will silo those things off to to for our, our other colleagues on their other platforms to design and work through. For us, in Surge, which is going to be the central nervous system of PressCoin, is not going to have any advertising ever. Um, it's always going to be uh, fundamentally user funded. Um, but we will have other revenue streams, such as uh, there are many other things that we've been, look, we've been looking at, such as licensing our open inquiry process and things like that. So the general idea is that the way this works is our token, unlike other uh, cryptocurrencies out there at the moment, which are based on kind of mining through uh, having a computer use quite a lot of energy to work through these intensive algorithms you know which are often called like proof of work algorithms like bitcoin they work through these algorithms and once that's done they produce the coin um, and this process continues and the algorithms get more and more difficult as the supply of the coin increases we have a completely different approach um, which is to simply say, let's have our token tied to the existing revenue streams within our platforms. So the way this would work is that we have here we have Presscoin, here we have Insurge at the center, and several other platforms with their different revenue streams. And we're quite open to how um, different platforms that plug into the system want to develop their revenue streams. It's something that we want to give uh, that, as I said, that level of freedom to to, to media outlets to do that. Um, but we've made a choice that this is how we're going to do that. Um, we're going to, but we, but we have set these protocol parameters that these are the ethical parameters that we're operating by. Um, and the idea is that the token using the algorithms in our blockchain will be pegged to the total value of the revenue streams within the Prescoy system. So what that means is that your token value is backed by the existing revenue streams and the, also the value of all your technological assets and your intellectual property. So we have real technology, we've got our content management system, uh, uh, which is the Quintype CMS. We've got the blockchain infrastructure, we have a blockchain exchange, a uh, global currency exchange system by which people will be able to exchange their press coin tokens instantaneously with other fiat or cryptocurrencies, which I can talk about in a bit more detail, which we've already built um, and, is abs and is functioning. Um, and we have a lot of other technology and we also have some uh, uh, software that we're bringing to insert 
in how we kind of deal and process the open inquiry format, which is already there and just needs to be needed, a, which is why we're doing an ICO to raise the money to then integrate this into a whole system. And because a lot of that is kind of in disparate parts, we have all of this technology. So what will happen is that the value of that technology and the value of the revenue streams will be pegged to the value of the asset. So the, the value of the token, sorry. So the idea is that you have the first, for the first time you have a token which is asset backed, which is I think is a very rare thing these days in the crypto world. And the other interesting thing that, that we're doing is we're gonna give people who buy tokens uh, shares in our company. So we have a, a PLC which we've set up in the UK um, and we've gone through all the regulatory hoops. We have um, a very expensive lawyers in New York who have been consulting about all these issues to do with securities and all this other stuff. So we've run this by them and we've gone through and we've come up with a model that really works uh, and that our lawyers are satisfied with that we're, we're totally clean when it comes to regulation. And so we, we can issue shares on the basis of tokens that people purchase and those shares will give token holders in that sense, literally ownership over our company. Um, so the idea is that people will also be able to not just um, participate through these tokens in terms of we're gonna, uh, we can now make choices about funding journalists, we can, there'll be crowdfunding opportunities on the platform. There'll be all sorts of ways which we can use, that, that participants can use these tokens in a, as, as a traditional utility token as with other cryptos, but they'd also be able to do the shares and dividends on a quarterly basis. And those dividends will be calculated, um, they'll be paid in press coin tokens, um, but, and they'll be calculated on the basis of how you normally calculate uh, shares of the total uh, profits of the company. So the way this works, like, what we're trying to do really is create a system where for the first time, uh, your actual users and readers and viewers of your media are owners with you of the enterprise and beneficiaries with you of the enterprise in a way that's never been done before. And we think that that can be completely revolutionary in, in terms of how we organize and structure media. That's exactly the word that came to my mind before you said it is revolutionary. This is definitely something that we haven't seen before. It's a form of, it's not really even crowdfunding in a way. It's a participatory crowdfunding. We should mention that they need to go to presscoin.com. There's a, I think there's still a white paper up about that. This can be very confusing to the average person who hasn't fooled around with us with cryptocurrency. And I want to underline, by the way, because you're supposed to say these disclaimers, that I am not in any way, none, neither one of us in any are trying to incite you in any way to invest in this. This is information. So that's the legal thing that the lawyers tell you you have to say. Uh, but but uh, the difference between Bitcoin, which you referenced as it's really, I, I don't want to say anything negative about it, but the point is it doesn't really stand for anything except quick, a quick profit. Aside from Bitcoin, Ethereum is uh, something that I have heard associated with different products, projects, sorry, projects. And it makes sense because then Ethereum actually does things other than just make money for people, although that's doing well too, the last few weeks. Uh, and Ethereum is how I purchased some news tokens from uh, from um, press coin and the ico initial coin offering that's on now it just started a few days ago how long is that going on and what happens the day that ends the ico opened on the 11th of december the initial coin offering which is basically the crowd sale of our tokens um and it's going to close i believe on the 8th of january um but it's a 28 day um i may be slightly off but it was a 28 day um crowd sale um We've issued um, 100 million. We're issuing 100 million tokens for sale, um, and they're valued. We're valuing them at one dollar a token. So it, we are aiming to raise 100 million dollars in order to fund the development of the platforms, for the further development of the platforms. Um, and any tokens that aren't sold uh, by the time we get to the end of the crowd sale will be burned. They'll just be done with. Um, 
and so that will be how we that will be kind of the, the where we kind of stop the valuation or the rest of it and at that point what we'll have to do um is assess how successful we've been with the crowd sale and in terms of the immediate steps forward we won't be saying we're going to suddenly start trading press coin because we're going to have to do the development work with the ico money which is why we're running the ico to, to finalize the building of the press coin blockchain and all the rest of it um but we do have a very clear uh, development timeline which we've laid out it's available on the website where we've explained what the expenditures are likely to be um how, how we've planned it out and also what we believe the development timeline looks like um, once we achieve the ICO, uh, once Chiva goes with the ICO. So that's all very clearly set out there for people who are interested on, uh, I think it's on ico.presscoin.com. You can get some, some nice graphics which give a bit more detail on that. Right, well that's excellent. Uh, I wanna circle back to you personally again to because we encourage people to go look at this information and read it and we'll have some stuff on the screen that they can see to help them uh figure that out uh, but my question to you whoops okay. my uh ultimate question to you is really what is your reason for waking up in the morning how do you feel and what do you look forward to most besides obviously family and friends uh, professionally, what is the big challenge? Do you wake up every morning and go, I'm going to climb that mountain? How does that work for you? Well, <laughs> these, days, these days I'm waking up every morning to hundreds of emails, to hundreds of WhatsApp conversations, and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> I need to catch up. <laughs> so things are moving really fast. But I mean, in terms, I mean, to, 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 your, to your point, yes, I mean, what keeps me going every day is, first of all, the fundamental recognition that has emerged in the last few years of my work um, and people who are interested in in, in learning a little, little bit further they can uh, check out my my last uh, my scientific monograph failing states collapsing systems which they can also they can read for free um, if you google it and, uh, and look for uh, academia.edu i've posted up the monograph for anybody to read and um, what they will get from that is a sense of my latest understanding of where we are as a species which is i believe that we are on the cusp of a fundamental civilizational transition um, but it's also a fork in the road where we can continue business as usual uh, which uh, if we did that um, all the warning signs are telling us that it's a road to absolute disaster and potentially at some point the annihilation of our species um, the destruction of much life on the planet even looking at one particular scenario involving climate change alone, the, uh, the consensus position is that the business as usual scenario eventually leads to an uninhabitable planet. And these are all, of course, unacceptable outcomes. And the alternative to that really is a fundamental restructuring and reorganizing of how we do civilization, how we organize things, moving away from extreme dependence on fossil fuels, uh, moving into clean energy resources, but but more than that, fundamentally reworking how we how we live and work, how we how we run our economies, how we organise things, how we structure them in a way that engenders real participation. Because right now, what's happening is we have this link between this very unequal system that doesn't engender participation, which which actually accelerates this unequal access to resources. It's built on unequal access to resources and it accelerates that and, in, and deepens it. And what we really need is a system which does the opposite, which, which, which enfranchises more people with access to resources and gives them the power to make decisions for their own lives within that basis. That's the kind of system, it's the only kind of system that will work in the long run that will allow us to to avoid these these calamities that we're seeing ahead in terms of the warning signs and that will actually fulfill um our our very not just our physical needs for you know for good food and and and, and you know fresh water and all the things that we need to survive but also you know well-being you know for, for us to kind of live together happily what one of the things that make life really worth living what we're seeing it's not it's not excessive gdp continually growing um, you know, it's it's a lot of other things 
which yeah have certain material necessities make that make those things a lot some sometimes more accessible um but there is a cap where we don't need to have endless amounts of stuff in order to be happy in fact that makes us rather unhappy and it's that that overarching framework of of seeing that we 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 are facing a crisis of civilization which has which 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 has really um a, a big implication that we need to make a choice that that keeps me going uh and, it's, and in a spiritual sense i really see that it's our responsibility as human beings attached to this planet to play that role as custodians of the planet because we have this consciousness now which maybe our, our our in the past we didn't have you know uh but we have this really we have a sense of consciousness now in a way that our our ancestors didn't you know where we have a, an amazing ability to see what's coming an amazing ability to see things in a global way that people didn't have before and i think that really gives us a sense of that of, of that greater responsibility now to make choices which are commensurate with that larger ability to see things and it's an opportunity i think it's a really it's really is an opportunity to to dream weave and build worlds that maybe we didn't imagine would be possible you know, several hundred years ago now we can look forward and say well actually i think it might be possible to create uh, a way of being which really does give people uh the possibility of seeing beauty and, and wonder in the, in the in in their lives um so that's really what keeps me going is that i see that as something i'm trying to do in all the things that i'm building and i see press coin is really one fundamental mechanism to do this because one of the big things i saw when i wrote this uh, monograph people can check it out is we saw information i saw information as being the linchpin to the transition moment um and, and actually it's a, it's a kind of a there's a kind of a slightly more scientific basis for that which is that when we look at evolutionary theory it's the ability to process information that is integral to an organism's capacity to adapt to environmental conditions and what we're seeing right now is is actually that the human species as a whole is cognitively very very challenged our information systems are complete disarray you know we have social platforms dominating everything these days like google and facebook but but we're seeing that they are susceptible to gaming and manipulation um and as you were saying randy you know our traditional media institutions are owned by a tiny number of people all of whom have vested interests largely and in these interlocking systems which are sending us on this trajectory of business as usual which is absolutely devastating the planet so this this information infrastructure has to change in some way in order for people to be able to process that information the real information in that sense generating intelligence about the world not just memes and and data points but it, but kind of intelligence that gives the ability to act and essentially to adapt as a civilization as a species collectively to the challenges that we're facing that's really what i am trying to do with insurge and with the press coin infrastructure that we're building is create the beginnings of that infrastructure i hope that we'll be able that you will be able to pierce the veil uh, i feel like we're living in a period that is somewhere between the movie matrix and the movie idiocracy uh where we're all happy then there's another one what was it wall e right where we're all happy <laughs> to just you know, when you know facebook um which i am not on in any significant way uh, but when i did experience it basically people are just throwing balancing these memes and uh you know bouncing off each other then there's some people who just want to be they're uh, arguing political stuff and it doesn't matter what side it's on it's it just it's just a mess and hopefully some kind of clarity will come out of that we could talk i could talk and listen to you for hours and there's so many subjects that we haven't covered uh, big big items maybe we can speak again but i did have one last final question which is besides your own would you recommend any books is there anything you're reading that you find particularly compelling at the moment or do you even have time to read <laughs> Lit well right now I'm not I'm literally not I'm not in the middle of reading anything. Um but I mean I think if people want to I mean, one of the things that is very important for people to understand right now is the concept of energy return on investment. Um 
EROI, which is a scientific concept, which I address in my own work, um, which really relates to the way in which we are using energy at the moment um, and how much energy we're, put, we're putting in to get energy out. And it's a very interesting ratio that reveals an awful lot about the increasingly uneconomical way in which we're exploiting energy resources. And it's quite interesting because even though we may feel and believe that energy is in abundance in some ways, and, and, and certainly the quantity of oil on the planet is, is huge, um, and, but what's happening when you apply the EROI metric to that you come away with a really interesting picture which shows that the amount of energy that we're actually using to extract you know this abundant from this abundant supply of oil which is you know from a shale oil and gas or unconventional oil and gas what we're seeing is that actually the amount of energy we're using is increasing to get this energy out and it's having this underlying economic impact which is quite devastating and it's also environmentally really really problematic when you begin to study those metrics and project them onwards it has very very interesting implications for where our civilization is headed so i would suggest people check out the work of uh, charles hall he was my series editor uh, for, the, for that for that particular book um and and anybody writing in the space of eroi in order to kind of get a handle on, on really what's going on the underlying energy economic dynamics of where our civilization is heading right now all right, Dr. Nafiz Ahmed, I am looking so forward to reading your next stuff. By the way, you're on Medium. We will put all this stuff on the uh, screen so that they'll see it. I uh, follow you on Medium, and I recommend Fantastic. everybody else does too. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Randy.